<clears throat> All right. I think my lighting looks okay. All right, Drew, you ready to do this? I'm ready to do this. We should go ahead and do it since we're here. Let's do it. Why not? Welcome, everybody, to episode number 20. Five of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. Yeah, you are. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about our current ink recommendations in every color group. Lots of hyperlinking for Drew to do in our YouTube description. <laughs> Filling and maintaining different pen mechanisms and the pros and cons of cheap paper, as well as what we did for Thanksgiving, because that just happened and we just took last week off. So we are catching up a little bit, aren't we, Drew? Yes. <laughs> well said. All right. <laughs> some more some, some more than others. <laughs> I was like, Drew, let's try and shoot this thing as close to one o'clock as possible on we're actually shooting this on Tuesday. And then uh, here it is, 2.11, and we're now recording, all because of me. So, you know, you gotta be flexible sometimes. Um, I have a daughter who's feeling a little under the weather and is home from school today, so had to make my day flexible. All right, um, let's start off with some feedback, shall we, Drew? I bet we got a bit of it, don't we? We did get a bit of feedback, Brian. Um, this was in response to a question on episode 23 of the Goulet Pencast, where we spoke about what to give somebody if you wanted to really rope them into the fountain pen hobby. And Brad had a response and a bit of a story to tell us. Mm. And Brad says, this reminds me of a story of how I converted one of my classmates in high school to try a fountain pen, and he loved it. Great story, right? Nice. There's a twist. Wait a minute. One day, I saw my dream fountain pen on eBay. I bid on it and lost by $200, Ooh. and there was only one other bidder. Mm. Turns out, the winner was that classmate that I converted. Oh, no. He happens to be... <laughs> He happens to be the richest kid in school. Anyways, I learned not to ask how I can convert someone to fountain pens, but rather, should I convert someone to fountain pens? Ooh, <laughs> I guess for every for every uh, every every person you penable, you also penable a potential bidder on eBay. So sounds to me like I, still... I mean, you could you could partner up with that friend, and the two of you could work together, and uh, <laughs> you know. Hawk those uh, deals on eBay together, and then kind of divide and conquer. That's what it sounds like to me. Um, yeah, sorry, Brad. That is a that's a bummer. Yeah. But um, I think the pen world is still better with more people in it. So uh, mm. I'd, I'd say that you it was a worthy sacrifice on your part. <laughs> and then uh, a comment by Bruno on YouTube uh, just simply says the redness of Drew's face while Brian was singing should go straight into the backlog of colors for Goulet exclusive pens. Mm. And I think that someone also mentioned like uh, pink brown being a color since I was pink and my last name is Brown. So, yeah, yeah, I, I am already a fairly pink human being, but uh, it doesn't take a lot for me to just go full on like saguaro wine um, or ottoman rose. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's true. It's, I I don't often try to embarrass you to that level, because that's oh thank that's you. That's gonna start to actually make me uncomfortable. When your your <laughs> discomfort is so pervasive, it makes everyone in the room uncomfortable. No, I still want it to be, you know, kind of like when you're picking on your sibling and like it gets to the point where like they're crying like actual tears. You're like, oh, this isn't fun anymore. It kind of feels like that. So you know, gotta keep it lighthearted enough. Just for just right, for you no, kind of squirm it'll... a little bit, and you're like smiling through the pain that's that's the sweet spot for me right there <laughs> yeah it takes it, it, it i'm it does it takes almost nothing like i'm i'm unoffendable like I, I won't get offended by pretty much anything but i get uncomfortable about just about everything so mm. uh the pendulum swings pretty hard on that <laughs> There you go. What about you? What kind of feedback do you have for us, Brian? Uh, well, I got a few. Uh, one is from Jen. And Jen says, I very much enjoy your podcast slash vidcast. And I'm not a podcast person, Jen says in parentheses. This is like listening to my own personal radio station. Keep it going, guys. <laughs> I'm glad. Glad you're enjoying this, Jen. It's like we're inside your head, which is uh, probably scary for maybe what your state of being is as well as ours but anyway we're all in it together um, i mean i don't want i don't even like me in my own head so <laughs> sorry right 
Uh, this next one is from Just Us. I don't know if it's Just Us or like Justice as in the Justice 95. Maybe they're a Justice 95 fan. Um, it did have a last name on YouTube, but okay. yeah, just Justice. Yeah. Fair enough. The pure joy I had when Brian started singing Don Quixote made my whole day. It made Drew's whole day too. Made the whole day uncomfortable. Uh, that book and the plays were very important to me in my developmental years and aren't widely popular these days. So that was a happy time. Well, that's really cool. I'm glad to hear that. And, uh, you know, it uh, reminded me of a podcast that I listened to a little while ago. Um, so Mike Rowe, from the guy from Dirty Jobs, um, he's got a podcast called The Way I Heard It. Started out being a podcast just about like short stories with a twist kind of thing, which are pretty cool. Um, now he has like guests on and things like that. So he actually had a guy, I can't remember his name, and I did not go back and listen to the audio podcast because I did not make the time to do so to actually pull the guy's name, but he uh, made a movie about Dante Quixote recently, or it's coming out soon or something that apparently is pretty good and is winning some awards and stuff. Um, but anyway, it's a kind of a cool backstory about some of the lesser known things about, you know, Don Quixote and the author who I'm failing to remember. I've not read it, but uh, whoever the author is, I'm shame on me. But it basically, it was like the first popular novel, like the first first popular fiction that uh, that ever came out. And uh, you know, clearly, it's still known about today. And they made it for Men of La Mancha, and that's what Robert Goulet. That was his big break. And uh, I got to grow up my entire childhood with people asking, "Are you related to Robert Goulet?" I am not joking. I can't tell you how many times I had to answer that question. But that's okay because uh, you know he was generally a liked person. It's not like he was some kind of like weird perv or something and people had to be like oh are you related to him like no not anyway so it's kind of cool and i can also sing somewhat so glad that brought some joy to you but anyway if you want to hear the podcast that mike Rowe had it's on episode 219 the beard is getting itchy is the title he likes to title his podcast with things that are not that relevant which made it really hard to go back and find this one because i was like what the heck was the name of that episode where he had the don quixote guy on there oh man it took me like 20 minutes to find it anyway so sorry if we're doing that to you too but oh well we probably have less notable and referenceable things happening on this podcast but uh and then the other piece of feedback i had was from beth it says congrats on the 12 years of business success thank you beth that adaptation is a huge strength, and you ought to all be proud of what you've accomplished, including staying in business through so, so much. Brian, what did you play in marching band? There's definitely a correlation between brass players and fountain pen hobbyists. That's a new one for me. I wasn't aware. Yeah, that's a new one for me, too. Yeah, I don't know. Probably musicians in fountain pen people, because I can see that as being something, you know, there's a barrier to entry. It's something you have to practice a lot. You know, you you connect with other people who are also into it kind of thing. I could see there being a correlation there. Instrumentalists or singers or whatever. But um, yeah, so I played a lot of instruments back in the day. Some of them well, but most of them just well enough. Um, but uh, the things I actually marched with on the field in high school, I marched the clarinet. Woo, super popular probably the most useless instrument to march with on a field because it does not carry at all. You could have a thousand clarinets on a football field and you would not hear any of them. Uh, but anyway, I was a big person, so I guess I showed up as a body on the field. Uh, but I played the contrabass clarinet in high school when I was inside. You can't really march with that because it's like six feet tall and you have to sit on a stool to play it. It looks like a giant sink pipe. Google it. It's pretty fun. Um, there's two different versions. There's like a compact one and then there's one that's really long. I had the really long, tall one. Not I. The school had one and I played it. Anyway, uh, so I marched clarinet. That's why I did that. And then when I went to college, I marched the tenor sax. My freshman year, hadn't played it before, just decided to because I didn't want to march clarinet. And then... Uh, Switched to sousaphone my sophomore and junior year. Never played a brass instrument. Didn't play it great. I think I played it the absolute bare minimum that was acceptable, but I was a large person and I could march well with a sousaphone on my shoulder. It was in a military marching band, so you had to have precision and these types of things. So they were like, well, you're large and you can march with it, so just don't play that loud and just march really sharp. <laughs> and that's what I did successfully. That was pretty fun. So yeah, there you go. I don't know that I would consider myself a brass instrumentalist because I basically just made giant fart noises on my sousaphone. That's pretty much <laughs> what that thing sounds like if you don't know what you're playing. 
if you don't know a sousaphone, that's the giant tuba thing that like wraps around your whole body and the bell comes up and you're like, if you make any mistake marching with a sousaphone, literally everyone sees it because it's like this giant flashing thing that uh, brings everybody's attention to your your situation that sort of that and the the uh, tuba can be a very comedic instrument when used oh absolutely in, uh, for intentional comedy like i think that of all the instruments there are a few that are as easily identified as comedic sounds uh other like the, the tuba and the sousaphone have to be right up there oh yeah that's right you know or just like footsteps bump Womp, womp, womp. Like, or like, it's easy. I could, I could rock the Jaws intro. You know, it's two, oh, there two you notes. Go. Pretty there easy you to go. do. Or like the the boom, 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 boom. Like for the yeah, exactly. The, the, the there you sad, go. Disappointing goof on the Price is Right. Yeah, that kind of thing. It's lots of that type of stuff. So I mean, it's making me smile just thinking about it. Like <laughs> exactly. The, it's it's like really like Three Stooges type humor. Like very the very basics, which yes. is great. Yeah. Those, those core fundamentals of comedy. Yes. But see, uh, I'm going on a complete tangent here, but one of the one of the things that we prided ourselves in, so I was in the Heidi Tidies, which is the military regiment band at Virginia Tech in the Corps of Cadets. So I was in like full dress uniform, marching, super precision. So one of the things that we were kind of known for is when we marched in a parade, um, you would do something called a counter march. So you would march forward and then you would basically pivot back 90 and pivot 90 again. And then you would march back between the ranks who were still marching. So yeah. we never stopped marching when we did a parade. So if the parade itself stopped, we did a counter march and we just marched within ourselves. So you can imagine what that's like with a huge sousaphone to march with other people like in the opposite direction on both sides of you. Precision kind of matters. And uh, there were some I feel s- like situations it, it, where we would get tight. <laughs> in, in those scenarios, I feel like it's the responsibility of the other people to get out of your way. Well, you know, that's where it's like, you know, it's <laughs> like if you're driving on the road and you have like the big jacked up like pickup truck and somebody else is in a tiny little sedan. You're like, well, you know, if something goes down, you're, you're going to be in a worse situation than me. So maybe you should be a little more careful than me. You know, <laughs> you can take that to the extreme. But no, we would just try to march really precise. And sometimes people would like smack into us and stuff and you would have to not move because it would be super obvious if we moved. Anyway, total tangent. But there you go. There's some information about marching that you didn't care about but maybe now you maybe i made it interesting enough where you do anyway kind of fun so um let's talk about some new stuff shall we drew we got a bunch hey new stuff is always fun there's a bunch of new stuff and we could go like deep into all of these but we're not going to because i can already tell we're making this thing long um so i'm just going to kind of give a very cursory overview of my stuff and then you have yours as well so you can check it all out on gulepens.com it's all on our website um but some things of note if you haven't heard about them already we have the visconti homo sapiens dual touch so this is in camouflage black and cognac um basically it's a it's a gold nib pen that uh has leather on the body and then like a matte you know, precious metal finish to the rest of it. So um, kind of that that matte finish that uh, like the uh, the Medici's have that look really awesome, that, but with leather on it. So it's like, we don't have a lot of leather pens. We haven't had a lot of them. We have no idea if these are gonna be popular or not. I think they look pretty sharp. Other people are like, what is going on with leather? Apparently they treated it and, and stuff like that. It's, you know, so that it won't like stain as easily and stuff like that, but it's still leather. So. Be aware, just like when you buy a wood pen, you can put a finish on it, but it's still wood. It's not resin, it's not metal. So just be aware of that. Something you may have to have, you know, more delicate hands with, Um, but it looks really, really unique. So if you're into that vibe, go check them out. They look pretty cool. Um, Esterbrook came out with their SD Scarlet. So they have both a gold and a silver trim. It's a blue and red quartz material. I think it looks pretty sharp. If you're into that, you know, cigar shaped pen, pretty classic looking, it might be worth a gander. Gander as in a glance, not a gander as in a gathering of geese. Or is it, is it a male ge- a female geese? Male, a male goose? I think a gander is, maybe that's a female goose. I don't remember. I think it's also the group of geese. Anyway, I think it's a group. Is it a group? I think it, it yeah. might also be. What's good for the What's good for the gander and all that? Good for the goose is good for the gander. Yeah, I think it's the group, but I think it might also be one of the genders. I'm not sure. I don't know what I'm talking about, and I'm going to move on. S. T. Dupont <laughs> Line D Large Pen. We have that in the Starburst Blue in Sunburst 
black. So these are stunning finishes. These are, again, Yurushi lacquer finishes. Not quite as elaborate and detailed as the Space Odyssey, but kind of mimics that a little bit, where it's got this like yeah. ombre type of vibe with this like whitish, silverish kind of starburst thing. I think it looks really cool. I think if you wanted, you know, uh, essentially a, a less a, a, a overtly space themed, but still kind of like that that ombre kind of design. This one's definitely worth a look. It's gonna be the same like quality pen as the Space Odyssey would be, but I don't know, it looks kind of cool. I like that they're doing some different stuff in, uh, in their finishes. And then uh, the Monteverdi Regatta Sport Fountain Pen has a demo body, clear demo with rainbow trim. Why not? The Regatta is just like, you know what? C can we do it? Let's do it, Regatta. <laughs> It's like, uh, yeah, that pen is this ugly? Looks Maybe I don't know. Wild. Do it, you know. So the regattas are just wild, and this one looks pretty, pretty crazy. So uh, it's worth a look. You know, it kind of mimics some of the design like you have on like the Twisby Vac Seven Hundred with the rainbow trim. So if you're kind of into that vibe, it's like that, but with like more chunked out pieces and more rainbow kind of intersecting the different, you know, parts of the pen. Anyway, kind of neat. Limited edition. Go check it out while it's around. Drew. With chunked out pieces. Chunked isn't out, it? yeah, that's right. So we are getting two new colors of the Peniter Alchemist, previously ah, previously only available in that uh, darker blue. It's now going to be available in Krakatoa Green and Stromboli Black. And both of these also, in addition to just being totally different colors throughout, are going to have different trim colors as well, like rose gold and black. So all the trim is going to also change, which is cool. And I kind of wish they had started with all three colors. I think that that would have given the pen a bit more of a splash but hey you're getting a small splash and then a slightly bigger splash so two uh we talked previously in the pencast like weeks and weeks ago about aurora coming out with a new 88 called the uh tree lubiti and that is a demonstrator 88 with a um pvd brown uh coating on the metal hardware so it's a really unique pen and it is a demonstrator with brown hardware and that's not really a thing anywhere else. So I think it looks awesome. It's a, it, it's one of, uh, I believe it's gonna be the first in a series. So um, if you are into collecting, especially with Aurora, they you know have done series in the past, get in on the ground floor, this is gonna be the thing that kicks it off. And I don't know a ton about this one, but Visconti has a big, crazy limited edition in tribute to Dante Alighieri. Um, the Divine Comedy author, and he is uh, going to be personified on a big, crazy, obnoxious pen from Visconti with a big, crazy display with an angel and a devil, and mm -hmm. um, it's it's all that. There was an anniversary recently, so the um, yeah seven the tributes 700, are seven <coughs> hundred year anniversary, which is uh, yeah, it's not something you hit every day. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's not something you even hit uh, every 5,000, you know, so uh, <laughs> I'm saying uh, 700, whatever. It's a check it out. It's it's something that we've never seen before. So there's that. Uh, and then we also talked previously about this pen coming up, but the time is approaching. And by the time uh, this pencast launches, it will be now the Bennu Talisman in mistletoe the 2021 special edition for the holidays it is a lovely lovely pen and it is green and white with some silver flecked throughout and it's the talisman model so it's got a nice number six nib on it as well so a lot of fun stuff coming down the pipeline and last week we talked about the turkey hammock reference which was from a previous week where at the very very end the bitter end if you will of the pen cast where we were just really not talking about anything anyone cared about we said hey if you have listened to this far put turkey hammock in the comment because we just picked a random word and there were so many people that actually did we were just overwhelmed with just gratitude appreciation and whatever emotion like I, it was overwhelming that we actually made a turkey hammock sticker for you diehard uh pencast maniacs out there so it's available i'll put the link in the description if you want to adorn your water bottle or child with a sticker um you can go ahead and just slap that thing anywhere and no one will know why it's there or what it's from but you will know it's an inside joke from a 
pen cast about fountain pens. Yeah, it's, so, it's one of those things you don't even want to, have to explain to people because it's like, I need to explain no. like five different facets to this for you to even understand. And then when you do, you will not care at the end of it. But that that's almost what makes it that much more amazing. It's like, but what if you did? What if someone would be like, hey, is that the turkey hammock sticker you got there? Is that from the Gulab? <laughs> what would you do? I mean, that would be insane. What one thing that that happened, Brian, that I really do need to shout out. This is kind of feedback, but kind of not. So I was on Reddit today, okay, and someone had posted a picture of a sailor nib with some uh, orange kind of crust all over the imprint. All right, and I'm just I'm just scrolling through the comments, and one person just says crustaceans, <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> I see you. You're like, I know, I know. No no one else said it. No one else replied to this person or anything. They just said it. I'm like, there did you, we did go. Did you upvote their comment, Drew? Did you give them a, did you give them a little love? I, okay. I did. I did. I, I clicked the little fountain pen nib up. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so it's always nice seeing our people out there. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> oh, man. that's Crustaceans. Crustaceans. <laughs> like, all right, weirdo. What are you <laughs> saying? I mean, it's contextual. It's not like you said it on like... I don't know, a pop music, you know, <laughs> part of Reddit or something. Like it's contextual, sort no, of. You know. Beautiful. Mm. Put a smile on my face. <laughs> there you go. All right. Good stuff. Well, there you go. That's plenty of new stuff. Now we got some Q and A's for you all. We got a bunch of random stuff. A lot of ink. A lot of ink coverage, some paper, and converters, basically. A lot of just really random detailed stuff that we're gonna get into. No deep dives though. Though this first one does have a lot of bullet points to it. All right. Yes, it does. Kick us we, 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 can, we, can, we can make this one faster if we want it to be. But uh, anyway, but, question number one would, this week would comes we to us. Why would we make anything faster when we could? I don't you know. know. We won't. <laughs> no, we won't. We won't. Uh, question number one this week comes to us from Colin on YouTube. And he asks about, uh, basically, does this video from 2015 still hold up? And in this video, Brian, you recommend your picks for an ink of every color. So all the colors of the rainbow and then a little and some extras uh, and you named an ink for each one. Yeah. And in your original video, you said that your black was Noodler's Heart of Darkness. Okay. Your recommended blue was Liberty's Elysium. Recommended brown was uh, Sukushi. Burgundy was Noodler's Black Swan and Australian Roses. Your green was Private Reserve Spearmint. The gray choice was Noodler's Lexington Gray. Orange, Apache Sunset. Pink, Yamabudo. Purple, Diatrementus Aubergine, Red, Di Diamine Red Dragon, of course, Turquoise, Diamine Marine, which I know is a favorite of yours. Love and I, it. I, I've, you've, you've turned me on to that one. And then finally, Yellow, you picked J, Herban, Amberdy, Bird Amberdy. That's right. Stand by. Um, um, ombre <laughs> de Bermani. Um, amber de Bird Amberdy. Bird Amberdy. That goes back to the garage yeah. days, we used to call it that. Yeah. Um, I still stand by that original list. It's a very, very solid list. The one exception being that uh, Pilot Orochizuku Tsukushi has been noted by Pilot to be discontinued. We still have it. There's still an okay stock of it in the US. Um, we kind of asked them like, hey, when do you think it's actually gonna run out? Um, so they, they still have stock of it. They were just giving a, a big heads up about it. So it's probably gonna be available into early 2022. Uh, but I don't know exactly when it's going to go away. So that's that's the one thing that, like, because it's going away, I can't really say that it's going to hold up. But <clears throat> as of this moment, everything on that list still holds up. And I looked at them all again and was like, yeah. I mean, Private <clears throat> Reserve, Spearmint went away, and then it came back. <laughs> so if you'd asked a year ago, it would have been like, oh, not happening. But, you know, here we are. Now PR is back. Um, so, yeah, all those are still good. But I thought it was kind of a fun exercise to go through and be like, you know what? If I don't include anything on that original list and came up with a new list based on, you know, my own thoughts now, what would I recommend? So that's what I thought I'd do. So I got something to recommend and Drew's got something to recommend. And we have like 50 inks to link to and we probably won't link to them all. But anyway, you can just reference a video or Google it or whatever. OK, so for the black, I had uh, Urban Pearl Noir. It's a, it's, it's, I think it's actually the first black ink that we ever carried because it was with Urban and we carried it 12 years ago. And um, it's a great ink. It's wet, it's dark, it's easy to clean, easy to maintain, no crazy properties. It's very well behaved black ink. Just don't think that it gets enough love. It's great stuff. Um, blue, this one, you know, could be maybe considered a turquoise, but I put it in blue. Robert Oster Blue Water Ice. Love that. Just great shading, amazing color. I uh, thought that's worth uh, a mention. 
Uh, brown, I had diamine chocolate brown. It's literally like if you were to like melt a milk chocolate bar and smear it on the page. That's kind of what it looks like to me. So I like that, like that deep dark brown. Burgundy, I had diamine Syrah. It's a little bit more of a, it leans a little bit purple, kind of that wine color, but I think it's very fitting for the name. It looks really great, great shading. Um, came out a long time ago, but it still holds up in my opinion. Uh, green, I did Jacquerbon 1670 Emerald of Chivore. Okay, technically it's more of a teal. You could call it a turquoise, but I put it under green. Um, you know, it's a great color, super popular. And I think, you know, especially if you're just wanting something interesting, it's got glitter in it. It's got sheen to it. It's just a very unique ink and I love the color. For gray, I had Sailor Manyo Haha, which is a cool multi-tonal. It's not a dark, dark gray. And I still love Lexington gray. It's one of my favorites of all time. Um, so I, I, that, that one's got some permanence to it, which is also part of why I love it. But Haha is just a really interesting, really interesting gray. And it's something newer that we did not have in 2015. Uh, for orange, I went with a crustacean barnacle one, uh, Diamine Pumpkin. Maybe the OG crustacean ink, because that was, I think, the first one that we ever received crustacean uh, notices about it <laughs> was, was pumpkin. <laughs> crustacean notice yeah put 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 us on crustacean notice pumpkin was 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 there uh but it's a great great orange color deep orange very vibrant love it it's worth the trouble uh pink i did noodler's saguaro wine which you've already referenced drew it's just a rich magenta great shading i really don't feel like it gets mentioned enough um you know so that's a good one for that was the first bottle i ever broke <laughs> that's right or the only only is that the, only bottle i've ever dropped and have shattered at work is that the yeah. only bottle you've ever broken how about that mm -hmm. i'm trying to remember now which bottles i've broken i remember there was well, you've, there's the one that i broke when i spiked the package like a football when i was testing out um yep. i don't remember what ink that was though i think it was a new uh was a noodler's i ink. think it was liberty's elysium it might have been liberty's elysium yeah i'm pretty sure that was it i haven't broken a lot of ink believe it or not um, Randall dropped that bottle of Bay State that stayed in the old <sighs> warehouse for ever and will remain long after the earth is well, you know, melted by the sun. I was going to say, it's probably just melted a hole down to the center of the earth in the shape of that splatter. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, for purple, I had Lamy Crystal Azurite. Dark purple. It's got a green sheen to it. It's really psychedelic. And I love that color. Uh, red, and also didn't exist in 2015. Uh, red, I had Diamond Matador, which I know you had, Drew, because it's basically Red Dragon. And I just love that color. Um, Matator. Matator. That's right. Uh, turquoise. I had organic studio alanine. Rich color. Um, not that different from Diamine Marine, uh, but it has a, a more intense sheen to it, kind of a red sheen, which looks pretty cool. And then for yellow, I had Diamine Golden Sands, which is a glittery, shimmer tastic yellow golden ink. And it's basically as gold of an ink as you can get in a fountain pen. And I think it looks really cool and it didn't exist back then. So try to update the list, refresh it a little bit. I'm not saying like these are my favorite of these categories, but ones that I think are absolutely worth trying um, if you're into those colors. And that is my list, Drew. All right. You wanna, um, wanna mention yours or you think we're going to? Yeah, 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 I'll run through mine real quick. Cool. Um, I'm just I'm just adding a couple audibles because mm. you stole some of mine. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I did. Anyway. Drew came up with his list first, by the way. But uh, thank you, thank you. I was gonna me. say that. What? All right, so I'll go through mine pretty quick. For my black, I'm gonna go with Sailor Kiwaguro. For my blue, I'm gonna go Bay State Blue simply because if you have not tried it, you need to try it. There's nothing else like it. Put it in a pen you don't care about, but the actual ink that you're gonna see on the paper is gonna blow your mind. It's every bit as amazing as people say, and it stains every bit as easily as people say. So um, try it at least. My brown is going to be Noodler's Golden Brown. Shades like nothing else. Mm. I love it. Burgundy is going to be Noodler's Nightshade, one of my favorite inks to actually write. Nightshade. Mm. Green, PR Spearmint all the way. Love it. Um, uh, uh, avocado is also a good second one. Oh, yeah. Uh, my gray, I had Ha Ha, Brian stole it, so I'm going to go with Thunderfluff, oh, I didn't even, Sailor Ink Studio I didn't see, 224. Sorry, I totally overlooked that you had Ha Ha. I did not realize I stole that. Sorry. Oh, sure, sure you did. My orange is going to be Noodler's Cayenne. It's kind of a red orange, but it's awesome. Mm. My pink is going to be Noodler's Ottoman Rose, though I did think about Cigarro Wine. That's another They're good one. Good. My, my purple is going to be Robert Oster Summer Storm. Mm. That's one I recently discovered. It's a nice dusty purple. Mm. And then um, I'm going to remove Diamine Matator <laughs> in favor of Noodler's Red Black, which is a great mm. dark, 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 dark red if you wanted to have something pretty much black. But if you look closely, it's like, oh, no, I'm more excited than mm. that. 
And then turquoise, I'm going to go with Private Reserve Blue Suede. When I was doing the swabs for Private Reserve, once we recarried that brand, I looked at that and I'm like, oh my God, that I kind of refill in love with that's that one. one. And then finally, another Private Reserve, I'm going to finish off with yellow, and that's going to be Buttercup. Buttercup. A buttercup. That's a pretty true yellow. That's like a bright, sunshiny kind of yellow, right? But it's dark enough to see. And that was my thing. That there are like, a lot of nice looking. Yeah, it's like on the cusp. It, it's like the last. It's right on the cusp. As, I think you can still see it. Yeah, it's as bright as you can get without losing it altogether. Or, yeah. or and mistaking I know that, it for like a highlighter. <clears throat> and I know sometimes we sound like Noodlers fanboys here. So, you know, I didn't want to go all Noodlers. But I will say that one thing that you cannot go wrong with is getting <clears throat> the all of the primary colors from Noodlers. Noodlers yeah. brown, blue, like uh, purple, yellow, red, green, they're all really good. Yeah. I agree. All right. Next question we have. This is from Michael. I wonder what I have to do when a bottle of ink gets too low to use with a piston or vacuum filler. I can use my syringe to fill cartridges or converters, but what about these other pens? So pens with built-in filling mechanisms. Can you still syringe these, Drew? Please guide us, oh great master of the syringe. I got excited about this one, Brian, because there are things to talk about here. Mm -hmm. There are things to talk about here that we don't often get to talk about. True, because and... no one does them. <laughs> all right, <laughs> bottle stuff, all right? Okay. Now they should do them because there are a lot of exciting ways to do exactly what Michael needs to do. Okay. I agree. So Michael, if you have a Twisby pen, there are two phenomenal options available to you. Mm. The VAC 20 bottle and the Diamond 50 inkwell. So the Diamond 50 inkwell is the more expensive, larger of the two. It's glass, but it'll fit, you know, the larger Twisby pens and um, anything that has a kind of a removable grip. You can actually put a Twisby pen after you take the grip off right onto the bottle yeah. and the bottle itself has a steel a stainless steel straw that goes right to the bottom of the ink well so it's always going to be able to fill your pen regardless of how much ink is actually in the reservoir it's amazing you can take the top off and just use it as a plain old ink well if you want to um, but it's a great choice compatible with uh, your twisby pens that are in the larger size that have um, removable uh, um, grip sections so if you have a vac a vac pen uh the vac mini vac 700 vac 700 r then you can get a vac 20 bottle which again the pen itself attaches directly to the bottle you can tip the bottle upside down plunge up the plunger and that thing will get a full fill like we're talking you do that two or three times no air man it's amazing and it's a fun little bottle again it's versatile you can use it as a standard inkwell if you want to or just take off the top part of the top cap for use with a vac pen and not enough people know about these i think there are anybody if you're gifting a twisby to somebody and it's one of those pens give them one of those bottles because it makes filling fun speaking of making filling fun if you buy a, a noodler's ink bottle which there are a ton of or you can just buy an empty one they're you know they cost nothing on our website we always have them in stock because noodlers are super popular so we're always you know we always have extras so it's like one of the empty bottles you can pretty much count on being in stock you can then buy a, an ink miser intra bottle and this little um it's a little cup that sits inside of a noodler's ink bottle you can still put the cap on like normal but then you tip it upside down it fills the cup even if you've only got a little bit of ink in there fills the cup and gives you an amount of ink up at the very top so you can fill your pen even if the bottle is you know three quarters empty um, they also sell the ink shot which is a standalone little ink cup that has a little platform so you can just pour ink into it and um, just you know use it that way so the ink miser they're like five and six bucks like why not buy one brian we need to do a video on these because they're they're tremendously undervalued and underappreciated but they're really great and so cheap yeah they're so like, simple to use too yeah absolutely now the intra bottle pretty much only fits noodlers uh you could probably find some more bottles that it would fit in but just stick with noodlers they're easy they're affordable you know very accessible to get and that's it yeah go forth have fun michael yeah um i'll caveat that with saying you know drew you said that 
the the bottles don't cost anything. That's not true. They do have a cost <laughs> to them. He was he was speaking relatively. They're, not, they're, they're a couple of bucks. It's basically just the, for the labor of us kind of cataloging. Oh yeah, they're like super that. cheap though. Yeah, but you're um, a dollar or two, see. something like that, depending on the bottle. The fancier bottles, it costs a little bit more. Um, the rarer they are and stuff like that. But yeah, let's see a Noodler's bottle. I think Noodler's is like a dollar. I mean, $1. yeah, two dollars, two dollars, two dollars. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's pretty um pretty rare. But uh, we actually used to clean those bottles out like a long time ago, but then we actually stopped doing that because we found that people actually like to get a little bit of the leftover ink of whatever was in there. So it's a random bottle you get, uh, but it will be inky and you'll get to like swab up a, maybe a random color that you've never seen before. So a little side benefit yeah. there to buying a random bottle. Um, but anyway. Yeah, we sell, we sell all of our inky bottle, uh, all of our empty bottles. And mm -hmm. um, one thing that I've been wanting to do, Brian, I'm never, I'm probably not going to actually do this, but I'm going to tell you that I will. I want mm. to make little miniature terrariums, like closed terrariums. So it's like its own little ecosystem. Mm. Like, you know, they make, you can, if you do it right, you can seal them off yeah. and it will create its own thing. Like, why couldn't you do that with ink bottles and have like a bunch of different little I don't know. Can, habitats? It just seems like that would be very small. You'd have to be super precise with your different, you know, Which makes it aspects. cuter. You know what? That's, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if that's a thing, you know? Somebody should do that and take a picture so I don't have to. Yeah, please. Because my, my, mine would not look as good. I don't know. Maybe you can find inspiration. This could be your new thing, Drew. You do you have more 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 sense to add on to this one, Brian? I do actually. Looks like you have something unnecessary and obnoxious you want to talk about. I did about. add a couple of notes in here. <laughs> um, no, no, no. So, um, you know, one thing that's really helpful, and, and I was thinking like, how often are people really in this situation where they're the, at the, you have to be at the end of a bottle, which already means you're a pretty hardcore user. Um, yeah. And you have to be wanting to use that specific color with a piston or vac filler. So it's, it's pretty niche, you know, um, but I think the more common situation is when you're filling from ink samples, because a lot of times you might struggle to be able to okay. either fit your pen in, because a lot of these piston and vacuum pens, they might be slightly larger. So it might have a hard time fitting in some of the vials, or uh, it's just not enough ink to really be able to get in there, especially with something like vacuum filler. Um, so, you know, what everything Drew said is applicable. Um, but uh, I think if you have an ink syringe, um, there's some different techniques that you can use um, that are handy for that as well. Um, it's going to depend a lot on the pen, and uh, so your mileage may vary. But um, I have a video already out there. I think it's pretty old, but it still holds up. In fact, I believe I filmed it in my house like 10 years ago. But um, it's called the feed saturation filling method. I'm going to just, I'm not going to actually do it because you kind of need multiple hands and it's really hard to demonstrate without doing some fantastic stuff. Um, but basically you fill your syringe with ink, which you can do obviously until the bottle is completely empty. You take whatever your, it's, it's really for piston pens, not so much for a vac, um, but you take your piston like I have here and you put it all the way down as if you were going to fill it from a bottle. You take your syringe and you put, you know, a few drops of ink and saturate the feed so that it's completely full. And then basically you just draw your piston back until it sucks that ink out of the feed. And you do that repeatedly. And effectively what you're doing is you're just allowing the pen to draw ink into the pen through the feed just a little bit at a time. So if you're really determined or if you can get it filled halfway and you just wanna to top it off, it's a kind of a nice little hack to be able to do that without having to get a whole nother bottle and all these other things. So if you have an ink syringe around, you may already have everything that you need. Um, or, you know, I'm holding a Twisby here. There's, you know, Twisby, Pelican can do this with a lot of their, their pens, but um, a lot of them have removable nib units. Um, so you could obviously like, if you can pull the nib and feed out, that works. Or if you can pull off the nib unit as a whole, um, there's usually, you know, well, not usually, there always is going to be a hole where the ink is traveling down through anyway. And basically it's like a giant converter now and you can just fill the entire body of the pen by removing the nib unit. So um, that's a nice little hack. The Twisby um, VAC 700, you can do that as well, even though it's a vacuum filling pen. I would not recommend trying to remove the nib unit off of a Pilot Custom 823. They have very explicit warnings on there not to touch that nib unit. So do not do it with that pen. With that one, I'm afraid you're just gonna have to figure something else out. Um, but with the Twizy Vax 700, you can remove the nib unit. Oh boy, I hope I can do it with this one. Yeah, okay. I just hadn't pulled it before. Need a little more leverage. Okay, so the nib unit comes off there. Now with the Vax 700, you've got the seal to work around there. So you, you, you've got to kind of get it around there, but you know, I can still get the syringe in there just fine. So, you know, same principle works there. You put the nib unit back on and then 
you can be on your merry way. The only downfall of doing it that way is then your feed is not going to be saturated like it would be if you filled it directly from the bottle. So you've got to give it a little bit. You've got to let it let it work its way through, shake it down a little bit, or you know get a little bit of ink onto the feed, maybe from the syringe if you want to to help get it going. But it might take a minute or two just to get the ink going again. But once it does, it'll flow forever because it's a vacuum pen and it has a lot of ink capacity. Um, so there you go. So there may be certain pens that are kind of tough to work around it, um, especially if they're not removable in any way, shape or form, or if, you know, it has a feed that has no fins on it. So there's just like really no way to get ink in there. Um, but uh, I imagine it'll solve for probably 90% of the pens that you might come across in that situation. And that's it, That's all, I'm done. And there you have it. <laughs> All right. All right. Moving on. Question number three. Brian. Mm. John asks, <clears throat> whenever I buy a fountain pen with a converter, I always get a matching spare converter in case the original fails. Mm. Since none of my original converters have ever actually failed me, am I being over overly cautious? Have you ever had trouble with your converters? Any tips for converter maintenance? Mm. I'm assuming the tips for converter maintenance is tips as in like advice not tips as in like some sort of protective covering to put over your converter over the end of it like tip like a tip of it never mind we cannot be sure <laughs> but let us um, assume no so i don't know how long john has been using fountain pens long john i don't know i don't know about long john silver is over here Yarr. trying to fill his pens um no i would say it's never a bad idea to have a spare converter around or if it's a you know, a more obscure brand that has a kind of a special converter, having, you know, a couple on hand in general, if you have a bunch of different pens. But I think that if you're buying an extra converter to have on hand for every pen that you have, that's probably a bit overkill. Um, I mean, look, it's not going to go bad or anything. I mean, you can keep it as long as you want. Uh, so it's not really hurting anything. And it's a, it's really a pretty minimal investment on most pens uh, proportionally. So I wouldn't say like, oh my gosh, what a crazy thing to do. But it's like, I don't think you have to go that far. I think if you have, you know, one or two spare converters, say you have a Lamy as a good example, you know, if you have a converter for every Lamy pen you have, and then you have a couple extras on hand, you're fine. Uh, I don't think you need to to stock up necessarily because frankly, just most companies don't change their converters all that often, um, you know, maybe with some rare exception, but generally speaking, the pen companies that have used, been using their converters, they'll, they'll pretty much be using those converters for decades. So you can pretty much find replacements for them when you do need them. And uh, yeah, I think you're gonna be fine. I. I've not personally, I'm trying to think, have I ever like flat out just worn out a converter? And I don't know that I really have. I think maybe I've lost it or broken it by doing shenanigans, you know, cause you know me, Drew, I like to test various, maybe extreme circumstances and be like, oh, okay, well, let me try disassembling this converter that probably is not made to be disassembled. Oh, look at that, I snapped it. Okay, well, let's mm. not do it that way again. So I've had that, yep. like, that kind of situation, but I really haven't like, completely worn out a converter. Um, so I think I think you'll be fine. I th don't think you need to go that far um, with the, the spare for every pen. Um, as far as maintaining them goes, you know, um, it's, it's pretty basic. There's not a whole lot to them. You know, you basically got the outside of the body, which you don't really have to do anything with. I think just cleaning it out as you're cleaning out your pen as you normally would. So cleaning it out every time you change ink colors or if you've had the same color sitting in there for a month or more or two years like me, um, you know, it's a good idea to, to clean it out, you know, maybe with some dish soap and, um, you know, uranium, like I need to do sometimes with my pens. Um, but uh, <laughs> mine get pretty, mine get pretty, uh, they get pretty dirty after a while. I've had like pistons get stuck and stuff like that. And I have to like let them ah! soak and then, you know, stuff like that. But uh, so I, I do it because, you know, I know people might be in that situation. So I want to know what it's like oh, to be able to give advice stop. as an influencer. You know, it's just kind of like I do. So I do it for the people really is what it is, Drew. Not because of my own, Mongol. my own uh, bad habits. Um, but, uh, you know, so a, a, a converter like the, the platinum one here, which I think may be one of the few left that you can actually 
kind of easily disassemble. Um, so I, I have it so that I can show you what's going on. So you have, you know, the body of it, you have your shroud or whatever that's going to hold on the rest of the mechanism. And then you have basically a threaded rod with a seal on the end, and then your handle with some kind of mechanism parts and pieces in there that are going to spin it basically in the opposite direction. So as you twist it, it moves the piston rod down. So that's basically what it is. So a, pen, a converter like this is really easy because you can pretty much take it all apart, throw some Q-tips in there, swab it out, and you're good to go. Most converters, though, in recent years have gone away from being disassemblable, maybe for cost reasons, maybe for reliability reasons or something like that. It's probably just easier to machine fit them together and not make it so that there's all these threads and stuff like that that could potentially fail. I don't know. But either way, I know Lamy, well, you can still take apart Lamy's, I think. Um, there, it's, can, not, it's difficult. It's difficult. You can yank this shroud off if you're really determined, uh, but you can also ruin it too. So, you know. Okay, do whatever you want, but honestly, and if you're cleaning them out most of the time, you just like fill up the converter halfway with water, put your finger over the end of it, and shake it like a Polaroid picture. Even though you're not supposed to do that, it's from a song, but you're not actually supposed to shake Polaroid pictures. Anyway, um, but uh, the uh, the the converter will clean out usually just fine, uh, just with that. But uh, the one little thing that I do like to do with some converters, if you're using them a lot over a long period of time, um, sometimes the, the converters can feel a little stiff. You probably experienced this yourself, Drew, um, where it just like feels like work to do it, especially if you're flushing the pen out using the converter. If you're not using a bulb syringe, which I mean, you should definitely use a bulb syringe. Spoiler alert, we're going to talk about that here in a minute. Um, but uh, if you find that it's getting stiff, especially if you're constantly twisting and untwisting the verter converter to clean it out, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have more friction over time just as it's uh, rubbing against uh, the insides of the converter there. Um, so what I like to do is I use some silicone grease and I use some toothpicks. You know, I have the Le Elegance toothpicks, the fancy ones. You definitely don't need them. Literally any toothpick will do. Take a little bit of silicone grease, like dab it on the end of the toothpick, and then you can just like stick it inside the converter. Try not to get it on the opening of the converter, but just work it in there and kind of rub it along the walls of the inside of the converter and then work it back and forth a little bit and you'll notice that your converter piston will move much smoother. You can do the same thing with piston filling fountain pens that aren't easily disassembled. Uh, maybe even vacuum filling pens that aren't easily disassembled though all the ones I can think of, with the exception of Viscani, maybe are disassemblable. Uh, but anyway, so you can do this same little toothpick and silicone grease trick whenever you're trying to grease up a piston that's inside kind of a fixed being. Um, and uh, that's that's about as far as I go when maintaining these things. And it's not really so much because it like needs it, it's gonna hurt it. I'm sure it, there's some impact there, but it's more just like, I like the feel of it. I like it when the piston moves smoother. And so it's just a, it's more, it's more for me, Drew. It's, it's for me. I just like the experience of a smooth piston. I will say that it's one thing that uh, I do appreciate about the Platinum converters is that it is one of the more expensive converters out there, mm -hmm. um, but you get some bang for your buck because it is easily disassemblable, and I appreciate that. That's true. It's also your only choice because it's proprietary. So there's that. Yeah. <laughs> But those those cartridges are very very resilient, as we've mentioned before. Once uh, like they're going to be great for refilling. There you go. And I want to I want to let it be known that Drew totally left me in the lurch on this question. He has nothing under his bullet points in the notes, so he was totally just making me carry the load on this one. So hopefully I did okay. For That's everybody. what we do. We take we're supposed to take turns on who does the primary answer, and I your know. answer just was so all-encompassing, robust, and uh, flawless, Brian. You did such an excellent job. But notice I, can't, notice I can't just like leave it alone. When I leave it for you to answer, I still just interject my own <laughs> stuff as much in there. I really... Which makes it all the more important <sighs> that I hold my tongue whenever I can. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. I shouldn't make fun of you. It's I shouldn't good. make fun of you for that because we explicitly talked about trying to do that more and you are doing it better than me, so... It's okay. You do really, you, buddy. It's all right. Fault. Okay. All right, fair enough. Well, we're going to move it along here to M. Burns 42's question that says, does cheap paper make your pens run dry faster? Does cheap, well, cheap paper make your pens run dry faster? I had to think about that one a few times. but Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it will. It will. It's kind of like, you know, if you've ever seen advertisements for those old you know like paper towel commercials they'll dunk the competitor's towel in that bowl of clear but you know artificially colored water and then they'll dunk like the bounty towel in there and one sucks it up faster because it's just 
more absorbent. You know, paper is kind of the same way. You've got paper that ink really gets soaked into and ink that, you know, paper that where ink just sits on top. Now we're talking, we're not talking bowls of water and paper towels. We're scaling that back significantly. So the amount of which, like the, the gap between super absorbent paper and not absorbent paper, you know, if you tested them, I, I'd be willing to bet that the speed or rate at which you would see one exhaust your ink supply as opposed to the other would be not very large. So hmm. just the f physics wise, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's liquid, you know, it's water-based ink and, you know, it is going to absorb. So yeah, physics wise, yeah, it will, but I don't think you're going to notice. I don't think that, uh, and not, honestly, that that's only one element of it. You're talking about nib size plays a huge factor and the actual ink itself is also going to play a huge factor because inks absorb at different rates just based on the composition of the ink you know how much of it is water and then how much of it are other components be it dye or pigment or you know who knows what else if you're working with an ink that's water resistant and luminescent and dries fast like you know well not dries fast actually that'd be the opposite but you get what i'm saying the more things your ink claims to do as a feature the more stuff is added in to create those features so you know it's the trifecta you know it's the nib it's the paper it's the ink and you know all of those are going to be acting as variables in terms of how fast your ink is being exhausted from your pen so the answer is yes but there's a whole lot of other stuff going on as well yeah well said it was interesting because I, I was I was struggling with how to interpret this question as to like like pens running dry as in like using up all the ink in the reservoir or running dry as in like feeling <coughs> dry writing on the page. I guess it kind of speaks to some of the same thing. Like run dry as in like it could make you have skipping issues or something like that. Oh, okay. But I guess it's like a similar principle is like basically is absorbent is cheaper paper going to be more absorbent and thus demand more from your pen just in whatever way you choose to interpret that. So mm -hmm. in that respect, I, I do agree. I think it does make an impact because I do think that, um, you know, the more absorbent a paper is, the faster you're going to go through ink, the, the fatter your line is going to look and stuff like that because ink is capillary action. And if you have, you know, a, an, an increase of flow, it's 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 going to flow, you know, because what, at whatever rate the ink is going to flow, the rest of the ink is going to keep up with it, um, unless you do it so aggressively that it breaks a capillary action, which is not going to happen with, pa with paper. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, 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 we've never actually done any tests to see if like the absorbency of paper, like exactly what effect it has on how much ink consumption you have. I think because generally speaking, most people have so much ink, it's not really a problem. You're not, it's not really what you're worried about. It's more like, does the writing experience feel good? Does it look appealing to me on the page? The actual rate of consumption of ink is um, not the foremost concern for everybody. Um, you know, uh, I wanted to speak a little bit just about you know, the paper itself, you say cheaper paper, does it make it run dry faster? I think generally speaking, when you say cheaper paper, you might think more absorbent, but I think that's gotta be greatly interpolated in terms of the form factor as well, because paper can vary widely in terms of its pricing uh, for a couple of different reasons. You know, if you're talking like, you know, a ream of inkjet or, you know, uh, laser printer paper, it's going to be some of the most cost effective paper that you can get. Whereas if you get a bound journal, you know, of some internationally produced paper, that's going to be far more expensive. So, you know, you can get bound foreign paper that's very absorbent that might actually, you know, dry your pen out or use the ink more than a domestic ink resistant paper that is cheaper. So it's like not a hard fast rule, but I think we've spoken enough to the principles of it. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is in terms of paper costs and just cheap paper. This varies widely depending on where you are and where your paper is produced. Paper is very heavy. It's often, you know, taxed in different ways when it crosses borders and things like that. So there are a lot of costs associated with moving paper around that can make a paper very expensive, even if it's not a particularly fountain pen friendly paper. So, um, you know, whenever you're considering costs, just know that like cost can be an indicator, but it's like when all else is equal, it's a good indicator for quality paper. Um, but it's not necessarily going to mean that the more you spend, the better it's going to be for a fountain pen. You got to, you got to kind of like uh, know what you're know what you're getting and 
you know, if you live in Japan or France or somewhere like that, where there's a lot of really great paper that's made there, it's good that that really good paper is going to be pretty cheap. Whereas if you live in the U.S. and you have to import basically all your good paper, um, that that good paper is going to be far more expensive. So anyway, those are kind of my thoughts on that. I'm going to not elaborate more on the question that was supposed to be primarily Drew's answer. And it's all good. It's all good. I'm done. Well, this one, this one's all you, buddy. So moving on to our final question of the week, mm. question number five from Sarah Welsh eight. Mm. She asks, this is this is all you, buddy, because uh, it's about con pecky. Ooh. Sarah asks, what's an affordable ink similar to con pecky? Brian, you've been using this ink for quite quite a while as oh, uh, yes. one, one of your kind of one of your kind of go tos. Um, I'm gonna let you answer this and i'm gonna go grab some cleaning supplies real quick for our next uh segment Ooh, so okay i will be our, i will be rb okay go nuts great i'm definitely right, not gonna fun. say a bunch of nonsense about you while you're gone i you mean go ahead i'll just how definitely that just stick to the question yeah <laughs> okay. all right now that drew's not listening i think we all know the real reason he's going to get more coffee isn't he he's probably drank through all his coffee and now he's going to go and get some more. We know that's really why he's leaving. He's going to make some excuse and come back with some paper towels or whatever. And I'll be like, yeah, those were probably just sitting out of frame the whole time. I know why you were really gone, Drew. Let's be real. All right. Anyway, so um, what's an affordable ink similar to Konpeki? So Konpeki, great ink. I've been using this ink ever since it came out, you know, which was probably eight or nine years ago at this point. I don't remember exactly, but it's been a while. Um, one of the OG Pilot of Roshizuku colors. Love it, still highly recommend it. Um, it's not the least expensive ink, but it's not the most expensive either. I think it's worth every penny for what it is. But um, some ones that I think are fairly comparable and you know probably even more cost effective, uh, Noodler's Blue is a great one. Noodler's Blue Eel as well. That's just a more lubricated version of Noodler's Blue. The color is very similar. Um, I think you can uh, dilute these colors. They're, they're going to be more saturated than Konpeki, um, but if you use, uh, as with any Noodler's color, they're pretty much going to be saturated to the maximum degree of, you know, dye to water ratio as is humanly possible, um, because that's what Nathan really loves to do. So um, if you dilute it a little bit, you get an even truer match to Konpeki. Um, just a little bit of distilled water, maybe dilute it 10%, 15 20%, depending on your liking. Um, and you can stretch it even further. Uh, but already, it's going to be um, less expensive than uh, Konpeki by, by degrees. Um, I think Noodler's Liberty is Elysium, too. We basically kind of designed that's an exclusive Goulet ink. We designed that with Nathan to basically be a permanentish version of Noodler's Blue. So it makes sense that it's going to be fairly comparable. Uh, again, you could dilute that one a little bit as well. Um, you'll lose maybe some of the permanence qualities to it uh, if you dilute it because you're diluting the, you know, dyes that are permanent. Uh, but it'll still have some of its permanent uh, qualities as well. Um, I think PR American Blue is a pretty comparable one. Again, that's going to be a little more saturated, but you could dilute that one too. Get it closer to Konpeki, but it's going to be a more affordable version as well. As well as Monteverde Capri Blue. Uh, all these are going to be kind of in the similar vein. And there's a lot of ones that are, you know, closer, maybe a little more royal blue, have a little dustier, kind of a purplish color. But these are the ones that I stuck to that are like really the truest to a Konpeki. Um, I think some ones that are, you know, could be somewhat close in color, but maybe are not as affordable. I, so it's kind of an honorable mention. It doesn't really necessarily stay true to your original question, Sarah. But uh, Color versus Supernova is a pretty close match to it, as well as Sailor Manyo Kanagi. Uh, it's a tad darker, but still it's probably the closest Sailor ink uh, that I could find to it. I would have said Sky High back in the day, but uh, they discontinued that one, unfortunately. And then they recontinued it and they discontinued it again. So maybe they'll recontinue it again someday, but not right now. So anyway, you can probably still find it around. I mean, they didn't discontinue it that long ago. So Sky High might be an option, but um, not for long or maybe not ever. That's what I got. Did you have a good, did you have a good uh, venture, Drew? I did. I, I, yes. Yes, it was, yes. Um, one thing I'll add is that uh, on our website, we have a swab shop, which is an interactive tool you can use to select kind of the ink that you want to compare, and then a bunch of different inks that you can put side by side. So if you do have an ink that you want to match with another ink, it's super helpful. Blammo. Did you use the swab shop, Brian, to answer this question? You know what? I did. I absolutely did. Yeah, you did. I use I use our comparison tools on a pretty regular basis because let's oh yeah let's be honest when you're trying to compare 
things that are like this close in color, you can't recall it from memory exactly, you know? So I got to see it again. And uh, yeah, I'm not ashamed of that. Super helpful tool. For sure. Yeah, super helpful. It's super helpful. I just went to Swap Shop, clicked on blues, filtered out everything that was blue. It's more or less in shade order. It's kind of tough to get it exactly in shade order. Mm -hmm. But I went through there and kind of scanned up and down, made my, made my decisions, and then I typed it in. And then we had this, you know, pen cast, and we sat down and started recording, said a bunch of other things. <laughs> and then, uh, then I said the that's things. the whole timeline of events. That's, uh, this is yeah. the one time I will tell you: be like Brian Goulet, mm. use the swap shop. Everything else, uh, you should really question your life choices if you're modeling much <laughs> of what you do after me. Um, all right, all right. Well, we got a, a new segment here that we're trying out: some tips of the week. We have done this before uh, once, and now we're going to do another one. Right? We've just done one, right, Drew? I think that was it. Yes, so. this is number two. Number Brian two. and I are going to take turns on these. Yeah, so um, I knocked it out of the park last week. I'm just kidding. I don't know. I think I did adequate last time, and, uh, you know, Drew's going to take it away this week. So, Drew, what is our tip of the week? This week's tip of the week is literally about tips. So the bulb syringe, which, as you see here, is a tried-and-true, slightly weathered bulb syringe that we use every day here at the office over at our pen cleaning station but what you might find surprising is that we keep this one around and this one. Oh, they're well loved what happened they? what happened something's going on there yes we gave it the old snippy snippy because it helps to serve other purposes we also have one that kind of fits in between so hmm. if you clip these at a half inch and an inch <coughs> pardon me um this one obviously has been clipped an inch this one has been clipped a half inch from the original tip you can fit them on different things so in practice the bulb syringe is helpful for plugging it right into a grip section and then flushing out the grip section when this is full of water however something like this one which is a pilot grip section has a little piece of plastic inside that prevents a standard or stock bulb syringe from getting the seal you need so that the ink only travels one way. If you plug this thing up and it does not have a seal, you're going to get some ink that way and then some ink on you or water, inky water on you um, or a friend, family member, pet, shirt, rug, some place you don't want ink to be. So what do you do? Give it a snippy snippy and this thing can actually fit over the grip section like that and it's nice and tight start low and just kind of work your way back and because you don't want it to be too big because then it's not going to get a seal but with this you do get the seal and you can clean it just like that and same concept but you get that total seal and you're not squirting it you know all over your cat um one thing i will say is when this is full of water if you really squeeze it hard this thing can go shooting off into the sink or again who knows what it might hit, but you want to protect your nib. So hold this while you do it. Um, and then the half inch clipped one can be helpful for uh, other things. Again, you can also use this for pilot because it just barely can get wedged in there. Um, and also it can go over um, certain things and fits better within uh, ones that have an obstruction kind of near the end so it d doesn't hit that obstruction it can kind of uh get purchase on its uh, seal a little bit further back um this one is used less in my practice than this one and this one but you know at the cost of these things again they're, they're five bucks so it's helpful to keep a couple around but so uh, yeah clip your bulb syringe it can be helpful for uh a wide variety of nibs especially if you own a lot of pilots this one is super super helpful you can also use it to uh, just clean out a grip section if you want to you know these can plug right onto there uh, this is a standard uh, Conklin or Monteverde and then uh, you can also fill this with ink and um, write with it yeah uh, Brian did it <laughs> Brian did an April Fool's video years ago <laughs> where he, ago. he coined the, the Edison bulb filler and actually did that but uh, yeah, that's my tip of the week. Brian, any uh, anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, me personally, I just keep the regular <laughs> bulb syringe, and then I keep the you know the pilot one, if you if you will. Um, and just to clarify, for especially for audio listeners who aren't really seeing what these things look like, when he's, oh, yeah, when thank he's you. talking about a half inch or an inch, he's talking about 
like the length of the end of the thing that you're cutting off, not the actual diameter of the hole. If you do that, you're going to be cutting a whole lot off and then you're going to end up with this like a pen bathtub. Yeah. Um, so start start at the end of the uh, stock bulb syringe, work your way back a half inch for this, the uh, middle one, and work back a full inch for the yeah. one that fits so the I, pilot grip I use the essentially full inch one and then the regular one, and that meets pretty much all my needs. Even in a pinch, you know, if I don't have the cutoff one and I just have a regular uh, syringe, you can, I mean, they're they're rubber, right? So you can, you can essentially kind of morph or hold or squish it, you know, to fit whatever opening you more or less need to. You might get a little bit of, you know, squeeze. Um, but if you take like a paper towel or something, like for a pilot, for example, if you don't get a super tight fit, stick a paper towel or your fingers or something and wrap it around the edge where it's, it's making contact and that'll keep it from like squirting way out all over the place. So um, you can even make those work in a pinch, but the clipping thing definitely is a huge, huge plus. And I do that all the time myself. There you go. Awesome. Tip of the week. Thanks, Drew. All right, now onto the pen of the week. So we had alluded to last time. We were like, oh, we're gonna. Well, actually, uh, have all this wait, time. You, you you're skipping the hypothetical, Brian. Oh, I uh, I thought we were gonna do the thing. I, I see. Last time we skipped the hypothetical, we did the tip of the week. I didn't. Oh, okay. I didn't know we. Well, had this one. is it. We did. Okay. This is a really right. this is a really easy hypothetical. Okay. All right. Hypothetical, Brian. All right. Right now we have two holiday sweater themed retro fifty one pens that we have made. They're both long gone, so you can't get them anymore. But since it's the holidays, and since we have previously made a uh, Retro 51 based on a sweater that you owned, mm -hmm. I would like to ask you if you could own a sweater that was either the Abominable Sweater pen okay. or the Warm Hugs pen, which sweater would you actually like to own based on these two pens? Wow. This is really tough because, first off, the fact that the main uh, characters, I guess, the icons on the pens are wearing sweaters themselves is a huge plus, but that's on both pens. So mm -hmm. um, that uh, is not a distinguishing factor. I'm torn because blue is my favorite color. So I immediately, my, my gut instinct is the um, abominable sweater just because, but that looks sort of similar to the Santa Joss. So part of me is inclined to go warm hugs just because it's just a different looking sweater. And I feel like that would vary up the wardrobe a little bit more, you know, at a glance, you could be like, oh, abominable sweater, Santa Jaws, whatever, that's a blue, you know, sweater. Um, so I don't know, I'm very torn. I wanna say the blue one, I'm just gonna stand by blue. So abominable sweater, but <laughs> okay. it's really, really, really close. I figured you would say the blue one. Yeah, I would definitely pick warm hugs. I just think that the, uh, I, li I like the green and, um, one of my favorite holiday sweaters is a green kind of like this. So. That's right. All right, there you go. Easy enough, right? Nice. I like that. Now everybody's going to ask, they're like, hey, why don't you make a sweater? Or the thing? And no, we're not doing that. <laughs> I don't even know, I mean, I don't how, even know how, how we would do that. How do you that. even, yeah, how, how you would you even begin? How do you make a sweater? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to make a sweater. I mean, I know people who design sweaters, so I'm sure. But I mean, like, how many sweaters would you have to make to get a custom design sweater? I don't even know. Oh, God. I don't want to think about it. It's not going to happen. No, Just no. We can make you stickers. <laughs> we can put our logo on a coffee mug or something, but I, we can't. You know, sweaters is <laughs> sweaters is a bit much, probably. Um, all right. Uh, moving on to our next topic, sort of. This is the pen of the week, which is not really, but we're going to talk briefly about it. So last time Drew and I were like, oh, yeah, we're going to all kinds of time before the next one so we're going to look at everybody's comments and then we'll be able to ink them up and use them and all that well i don't know about you drew and not to skip sections but i had family in town and just nothing was happening for me so i didn't do anything with pens and i was like hey drew did you ink up anything he's like no i didn't do anything i was no, like dude, i was sick all weekend it was terrible yeah we had family or sickness happening everywhere so it was like nope okay so we're just going to push it so we don't have anything to talk about new i guess i used all the pens that i already had inked up because Shocker, I haven't cleaned any of them out yet. Um, so I just kept using the ones that I've been using recently and I just have enjoyed them that much more. So that's cool. It's not been a loss on my part, um, but we don't have any new pen to talk about. But Drew, you did look at some people's comments, right? And see what I did. is recommended. So uh, you and I have not talked about any of these, so we got to decide no. real time. No, we did get some recommendations. Um, a lot of, quite a few Caveco recommendations. Hmm. 
a few um i think that we got one maybe two people that recommended the caveco lilliput which is the tiny tiny pen mm. the platinum curados was also mentioned okay. as well as just the uh caveco sport mm. so super easy accessible one there and then someone just said something with a music nib talk about the music nib and your experience with a music nib and then finally we got a recommendation for the monteverde ritma mm. um so of these personally i'm interested in the curados and the lilliput i feel like there's a lot to talk about there they're pretty accessible i think mm -hmm. that um the curados is definitely unique and i have not spent a lot of time with one and i definitely have not spent a lot of time with the lilliput either and i'd be curious about you um with uh your hand size uh how you would deal with the lilliput um so yes between those two for me what what do you think yeah i was kind of drawn to those as well the ritma i haven't used a whole ton either but you know, that nib on that pen, I'm very, very familiar with. Yeah, that's kind of how so, I feel. I have used the Ritmo It would be more for like the form factor of the pen itself. But, you know, we've we've played with that one a little bit in the past. So, you know, yeah. that one's cool. The music nib is tough because there's really not many pens with a music nib. So, yeah, we could do that, but that's going to be kind of tough. And honestly, the Sailor music nib is pretty much just a stub. Really, you're talking the Platinum music or like the Noodler's music, which are two very different nibs. So, I mean, we could do that, but maybe we'll save that. We'll see if there's more interest in that. Um, the Quaco Sport, I'm very familiar with all of those. Yeah. So so let's do uh, Curados and Lilliput. Do we want to pick or shall I flip Queen Vicky? Oh, I mean, so I've used the Lilliput more than you have. Well, let's go with the, have, what about the Curados? Have you so, spent some time with that one? I did. You did when you did the video. I did, but not not in a while, not <clears throat> since they came out last year. So I could I could get reacquainted with a Curados. Well, let's do the Curados then. I'm curious about the Curados. Ah. <laughs> yep. All right. I did put my well, cool. I did put my Lilliput Fire Blue through the washer and dryer when it was in my pocket because it was so small and light. I didn't realize it was in there. So now it's a more faded Fire Blue, ah. <laughs> which is a little disappointing. You, but I don't know. Needs to go back in the fire. Yeah, I, I know that one. I can give an opinion on it without even having to use it right now. So I think you should do that one. I'll do a Curados. And uh, we'll reconvene. Oh, we want to do two different ones. Oh, is that? I thought that's what we were talking about. No. Oh, I don't, you wanna do that? I don't know. You want to do that? Um, I don't know. Maybe we should do the same thing. I definitely. I know. I know that I have a Curados out here. I don't have a. I would need to get a Lilliput from somewhere else. Probably your office. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I... Probably. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, let's do the Curados then. Let's both do a Curados. Yeah. We'll we'll reconvene offline and and see what pens we actually have and choose different nibs. How about that? Um, cool. Maybe a different color, but uh, yeah, that'll be fun. It'll be fun. Yeah. So join us if you happen to have a Platinum Curados. Uh, we will yeah. join you on this journey. Yeah, Drew, you can eyedropper fill yours. How about that? Ah ha ha! <laughs> You're not gonna get me again with that one. <laughs> I know how much you love eyedroppers. Um, okay. Let's move on to what is happening. What's happening in our actual lives? Drew, what's your well, what's your life all about? Let me just say, last time we spoke, you and I, I was wearing a Ghostbusters cardigan because I was super excited about the Ghostbusters movie, mm -hmm. Ghostbusters Afterlife. And oh my God, it was so, so good, Brian. Really? So good. Oh, man. It could not have been better. It was magnificent. Wow, that's awesome. I was... I, I I was crying like the whole last 15, 20 minutes. It was beautiful. But then again, I cry at like every movie. So like legitimately um, crying or like laughing, crying? No, or just no, like... no, no. Like, 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 like tears coming out of my eyes. But I will cry. Like literally, I think every Disney movie makes me cry. It's not hard for me. Mm. I'm a very emotional movie watcher. But mm. uh, this one, I've been just so into Ghostbusters for all my life. And this one really cashed in on my emotional connection to that movie so really really well done there couldn't have been happier there so go see it um thanksgiving happened that was a thing that went well really really grateful that my family is not dramatic or if they are dramatic they're just like outwardly dramatic and everybody's dramatic it's not there's no uh no awkwardness everybody's just like yeah i am who i am you're who you are everybody's cool and i'm just very thankful for that yeah, let's eat some um, pie a lot mm. of people a lot of people dread thanksgiving like oh gosh i hope this person doesn't bring that up you know but my family's not like that they're super super cool and i love them to death um this weekend i'm gonna go to uh southwest virginia like south southwest west virginia <laughs> 
pretty much uh, a, West Virginia. There's a lot of Southwest to go in Virginia. It's a very long, there really long is, but, state. Um, <laughs> yeah, my brothers and I are uh, renting a house on the New River. We're gonna do a little bit of kayaking, a little bit of hiking, hey. and uh, <clears throat> hopefully not fall in the water and freeze. Um, so mm. that's exciting. Hooray for that. The, uh, well, and, Drew, I went to Virginia Tech, and that is in the New River Valley. So I'm, that's right. I'm familiar. I mean, it's a long river, so you could be like mm. hundreds of miles away, but still. I'm vaguely familiar with the general yeah. area of what you're talking about. Yep. It's south of uh, south of Blacksburg, south, southwest. Southwest of, of the southwest Virginia. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's down there. Um, and then I bought a new thing that I want to show you, Brian. Ooh. Yes. I was at TJ Maxx this weekend. And I saw a thing, and I had to buy it. So you're gonna need to hang on, hang on one quick second. You talk a little bit about what you did. I'll be I right will back. talk a little bit. I'll just make note that Drew, in his bullet point in the notes, wrote "bought a new thing." So I have no idea what he's about to present. Uh, for me, I had family in town, a bunch of family. It was all Rachel's side of the family. Um, it was great. You know, it was you know it was a bunch of people in the house. Uh, we weren't quite used to that. So lots of just activity and noise and things going on <laughs> so that had its moments but um you know kind of like drew it's like we we have a lot of people who are very self-aware and and things like that so even whatever differences people have it was nothing uh dramatic and just uh, we're on really good relations with both sides of each other's family so um it was a really really great visit what did you steal my sweater drew no i bought it where did you find it at TJ Maxx. Oh, you mentioned TJ Maxx. Wow, that's that's yes. That's very motivating. How awesome is that? Because I saw that. I bought it at Target. I think years ago. I've yeah. I've never seen it since. I, I we were at TJ Maxx, <coughs> and uh, my wife was like, "Oh, look, there's a shirt that there's the sweater that Brian has." I was like, "You're like what? Wait, what?" I was like, "No joke. That's and you know what this is this this, this you know you know this is a new one because look at the sleeves." They're not all. <laughs> oh yeah, they're getting. They're gonna bag out. Yeah, they're gonna get there real quick. No, because I don't cuff my sweaters up to my biceps like you do. I do cuff my sweaters. I have to. I can't. I just. My body. You get too hot. My body. I'm so hot. I'm sweating right now. Just even in just this flannel shirt. It was, you know, it was like nice and. It was like Brian throughout the day. Like he'll start off wearing a normal sweater and then, <clears throat> and then he'll do the forearms and then like by the end of the day. <laughs> I'm just like They're all the way up there. I'm I'm always torn because my instinct is like, let me pull this up. I gotta get some raw skin to some air. But then it's like if I bunch up my sleeves, doesn't that like cut off the air to like the rest of my arm? Like is yeah. that just like trapping it, in like the warm air in my pits and making the sweating worse? I don't know. Oh I don't my god. Know. And then it puts like a bunched up massive bulk of fabric all in one place too. So. Well the sweaters are they don't have the same like you know, integrity to their like stretchiness that maybe a, a, a long sleeve tee might have or something like that. Right. I mean, notice right now, Drew, I'm rocking this. See, this is a, as I was putting the shirt on, which by the way, I put this shirt on, the sleeves were already rolled up because the, you know, I like don't, <laughs> oh, I don't yeah. even unroll them to wash them. I just wash them. So sometimes I'll end up with like one down and one still rolled up. But uh, you know, Drew's got, so this is my, my, my arm. There you go. That's as long. Oh, that's yeah. as long as it's gonna get, you know. This is how it goes. So I either have to be swimming in the shirt to get the sleeves long enough, but uh, it's usually not the case. Usually I just buy the right size and then. I thought end up about. With this. Um, I thought about picking you up one because I know that you know you've kind of worn worn yours out a bit. Uh, so there's pro they're probably still there at the. Uh, um, yeah, but you know they're the, not uh, like restocking those very much. They probably have some leftover stock. No, but I didn't know I didn't know what size you wanted. So. Um, I can I can I can pick you up one if you want to. I, what what TJ Maxx was that? Oh, it's the one by uh, Regency. Oh, okay. I mean, if you happen to be by there again, I'm an extra large. So uh, all right, you know, make no, make note of it. Yeah. There you go. I mean, these this 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 uh, this is immortalized <laughs> in pen form. Like this isn't gonna. It's pretty go classy. Away. I mean, I'm never gonna get yeah. I'm never gonna get rid of that sweater because you know. Yeah. Well, then you can have that one for your everyday sweater, but then you can have like a classy one for formal occasions, like when you need to represent the company at important events. I mean, Drew, that was a sweater. So you remember a couple of years ago when there was that New York Times article. I did an event at the Lamy store in New York City. That's right. You did represent the company at important events was, wearing that sweater. I, was wearing I totally that forgot. Sweater, that the, oh my God. With the nineteen fifties dad with a hair like mink and all that stuff That's from right. that from that article that came from that. I was wearing that sweater. 
That's right. And I was like, Oh my god, I totally um, forgot about that. Yep. So good, good vibes from that sweater, I guess. Yeah. But anyway, that's awesome. It was a little expensive for TJ Maxx. Normally, like I'm looking for like twelve dollar shirts at TJ Maxx. Oh, this well, one was twenty, but I'm like, you know, I mean, and I couldn't. That's say a no good sweater, that. though. I mean, that's that's a there's a yeah. lot of sweater happening right there for twenty bucks. That is <laughs> a agree. bargain. I've paid much more for holiday sweaters, much more. Anyway, so there you go. So that's what I did this weekend. <sighs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, I kind of already talked about uh, my family coming into town. Um, you know, Drew, I don't know if you feel like this, but I feel like especially with uh, COVID life here, we have not had a lot of guests over to our house. So, you know, once we actually have some guests that are going to be coming, I start to look around the house and I'm like, oh boy, like what happened to that guest room? Like what bomb went off in that <laughs> closet and exploded all over the room? You know, so it was kind of like, oh, like stuff just piles up. We have you know, kids clothes that they've outgrown for the last five years and they're just in bins. And it's like, oh, her sister's going to be in town. We should, uh, we should set all these aside and go through them. And if she doesn't want them, we should donate them so that we're not just like holding an entire closet worth of kids clothes. Uh, you know, so, uh, we took the opportunity to do that kind of stuff, um, which was really good. So we've been doing some nice, uh, purging and donating, which has been helpful. Um, you know, we did, uh, got like a little, uh, you know, just one of those dinky little like portable fire pit kind of things. It's basically just like a metal tr yeah. trash can lid that you burn things in. It's, <laughs> it's essentially kind of what it is. Um, but you know, as you know, I have no shortage of wood. I've been chopping trees down and all that kind of stuff. So uh, literally, it's like, oh yeah, it's getting kind of cold and uh, it's getting darker earlier now. And I have wood everywhere. Why don't I just burn some of it and we can like make s'mores and do all that kind of stuff? So we've done that like a few times now with the family, and it's like kind of cool you know and it's like okay our kids are old enough now where it's not like oh fire you're gonna like go stick your head in it because you're a kid and you don't know what's going on you know i don't know that's very morbid but you know what i mean like we don't have to be as concerned because our kids understand like what fire is and that it, you should not play with it okay sure um but uh you know kids definitely make fun of me for how much i burn my marshmallows because i'm very impatient and i just want to cook them and i always catch them on fire i think there's was... oh not me i am i am meticulous in my marshmallow roasting efforts it is lightly browned all the way around see i mean that's fine but like i don't mind a little bit of char so it's like oh if it catches on fire just blow it out but like everybody else makes such a big deal out of it they're like oh they burned another marshmallow and i'm like oh, really like do we need to like make a big deal out of it every time it happens anyway whatever i should probably just be more patient uh but anyway did a lot of that that was kind of fun i like you know fire school um and then we got our christmas tree up which was fun because it was like you know i knew with rachel it was gonna be like all right we're gonna be tired when all the family leaves we're gonna have to like clean the house and do all this kind of stuff let's not go crazy like if we want to get the tree up okay but we could like just put the tree up and then like maybe next weekend we can do the decorations and do the ornaments and stuff like that well, no, same thing happened that happens every single year. Like once that switch flipped, it was like Saturday morning. It was like, all right, Brian, get the tree down now. Okay. And she like pulled everything out of the attic and our just bedroom is filled with bins of decorations and stuff. And then she like kind of ran out of steam. And so now it's like, <laughs> there's just <laughs> bins of decorations everywhere. And it's kind of like, well, guess I'm going to deal with this now. So it was like, oh. you know. Yeah, it's, you want to like get in the spirit and get in the mood and all that kind of stuff, but it's like you forget like, oh yeah, this kind of like is involved and takes a while to kind of get going. So, you know, we have pacing, we are pacing ourselves now, but it's like, as we have time kind of throughout this week, we're decorating little things here and there. Um, but you will be pleased to know, Drew, that Rachel's fully embraced her little bird decoration collection thing. So there's these little birds you can nice. get. Nice, the target birds. The target birds, yep. So she's bought, I don't know how many of these things she has now, probably 40 of them. Um, what? Yeah, she's like leaned hard into the birds. Four zero. Yeah, probably. I don't know. We lost count. But we, we now not only have these little target bird decorations around the house, we have like flocks of birds because they have, you know, she's been buying them for several years and they have really cute ones they have ones that look like little lumberjacks and they have like flannel and you know like the cap with the thing over the ears and all oh, that yeah, and she's yeah, like yeah. she's like well i gotta get that for brian and you know so we have like halloween birds and fall birds and winter birds oh my God. And so I'm, I'm like how many birds do we have now and she's like <laughs> i'm like okay cool which I can't say anything because I have obsessive collections of pens and Rubik's cubes and Lego Technics and tools and all kinds of various things. Oh so yeah. Oh, she, this yeah. is like her, like one of her one things and it's pretty innocuous. So I was like, cool. 
All right, uh, birds. We're, we're just gonna. She doesn't love. We're doing birds. She particularly love birds. But there's a great sketch. If you haven't seen it, go on to YouTube and look at uh, Portlandia. Uh, put a bird on it. Uh, it's fantastic. So it's kind of like a hipster thing. Basically, they have like a shop where they just take antique looking things and they put birds on it. And they're like, you know, like this tea kettle, put a bird on it, you know? And it's really kind of funny because it's like we have birds everywhere now. And I'm like, cool, there we go, put a bird on it. So we now say that to each other a lot, but nice. it's cool. I'm totally cool with the birds. I think they're actually pretty adorable, but it's just really funny now. It'll be like flocks of birds like decorating our house now. It's like, okay, here we go. This is happening. <laughs> Um, I think it's likely that many of our listeners and viewers know the target birds we're talking about. Could very well be. They're adorable. They're, they're quite adorable. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, just spent a lot of time working outside. Um, did some trail clearing with my brother-in-law and my father-in-law. You know, they, they live up in northern Virginia, which is a much more populous area. They're in, like, a dense suburban area. And we've got some land here. So, you know, they come down here, and I'm like, y'all want to go cut some stuff in the woods? They're like, yeah. You know, because it's like super awesome and special to them. I'm like, great. What sort of dangerous gas powered devices does Brian have that we can play with? Yeah, we actually all had those. Yeah, I got like a backpack leaf blower. We have a, uh, it's called a brush cutter. So think of a weed whacker, but instead of having a, a trimmer string on the end, it's a giant blade. So mm -hmm. you have that. You could quite easily, you know, cut a, a tree that's like even maybe an inch or two in diameter um but it's for like weeds and like vines and stuff like that so we definitely were hacking that um uh one of the best <laughs> little fun fact if you want i've got a really good process for clearing like hand cut trails now this is something i've been doing for a year and actually it was kind of cool because it was i don't know somewhat ceremonious is that even a word whatever but when when my family came last year for thanksgiving i had just started clearing some trails but i really didn't know what i was doing um but we really like with their help we figured out like a good like process for like here's how you make a really nice trail through the woods that will be comfortable and last a long time um and then since then i've i mean i've cut at least a half mile of trails by hand through my woods um it's kind of a lot and we just had a blast walking around and like we go on walks with the family through the woods and i was like oh dang this is cool like kind of like put the maybe hundreds of hours of time i've spent clearing trails like into use you know for the family which is oh, gratifying i guess um but uh yeah so uh reciprocating saw is like the dark horse tool for trail clearing because if you have like small little small trees or like small stumps and tree roots and stuff like that that are coming across your trail um a reciprocating saw you know that's like use it a lot for like demolition for cutting two by fours and you know stuff like that but you can get a 12 inch pruning blade so the teeth are really really far apart and you can use it and and it's great because you can cut down in through the dirt so you can't like use a chainsaw or anything through the dirt because it just dulls the chain but these reciprocating saw blades you get the carbide tipped 12 inch pruning blades total game changer you can cut dang near anything with that it's pretty awesome i can cut small trees with that thing stumps like half rotted out stumps for trees that are like 16 inches that blade will cut right through it and you just go nuts on it it's pretty it's pretty gratifying um so yeah use battery powered reciprocating saws and just cut through it and it's it's very gratifying um and relatively safe it's definitely safer than a chainsaw um so yeah it's pretty fun and then a garden tiller so I like scrape the leaves and like the loam and like the, the small roots. And then I use a garden tiller on the trails and that tills up and then you got to cut a bunch of the roots and stuff like that. But then all you till up all that, that soil and then just naturally it compacts down after a week or two. I have trails that I cut over a year ago that are still just like dense packed dirt, smooth, you know, little things growing there here and there. But you know, you do that, you know, whatever leaf blow you know brush cut reciprocating saw tilling that is like the ticket you'll have gorgeous hand cut trails that you can weave throughout your woods very sim harmonious with nature going through the woods and uh yeah so anyway we did that a lot sorry this is like way more than you wanted to know about trail and <laughs> what just and happened Drew's like i hate going outside why are you telling me any of this what is happening clearly i've just been uh, a, a way more time doing this in my free time 
This is like a side of me that no one ever oh sees, but just I, I really... For all of you who are um, looking to listen to a fountain pen show where you learn about how to tr clear trails in your woods, I'm glad you tuned in today. I'm just saying, I'll post, I'll post a couple of pictures. And then what's cool is like, <laughs> whenever I have to cut a tree down, like a pretty substantial size tree, I'll, uh, I'll take and cut it into logs and I'll line the trail with the logs. So you get this really natural, cool looking path and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I'll post some pictures, but I mean, I think you'd be pretty impressed because um, I am. I'm impressed <laughs> with myself is what I'm trying to say. And uh, you should be too, but uh, either way. Um, but what's really nice about right now is it's colder because I sweat like crazy, you know, Drew. Um, but now I can wear like long sleeves and I'm not dying of sweat and uh, there's no bugs. So that's pretty great. So I'm just enjoying working outside when it's cold like this. It's just, it's never too cold. I will work outside when it's like zero degrees. It's just fantastic because I never get too cold. There we go, TMI. Let's move on. There we go. Let's move on to company updates, shall we? We'll slice that one out and put it on a new YouTube channel. <laughs> Drew's gonna slice it out and throw it away. <laughs> it's like, oh, no one needs to hear this. Um, yeah, right. I need a new YouTube channel like Goulet Homesteading, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. What's Brian doing in his woods? Um, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, uh, it's my, it's my, you know, everybody needs their like safe space. You know, some people like to go to the spa. Some people like to travel. I like to cut things down in the woods. It's just my, my peaceful place. Uh, peaceful, maybe not so much for the trees, but you know, that's cool. Um, company updates. Uh, we actually do have some cool news to share. So this is for OG pen fans that remember the brand Delta. Well, if you haven't heard the news, Delta is coming back. It's not every day that you see an old pen brand revived. Um, so Nino, who uh, Nino Marino, who's behind Mayora, uh, so basically has uh, acquired the rights to uh, manufacture Delta, the design, the logo, the name, all the stuff, a lot of the materials. Um, so yeah, like we may very well, see, and not just like, you know, vaguely, you know, inspired by old Delta, like we might start to see some like old school Delta looking stuff coming out again from, you know, one of the original founders of Delta, which is pretty sweet. So they've been gone now for what, five years maybe? Um, so it's not like, you know. Probably more than that. I think so. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. I mean, exactly we, we've been in this new building for like four, I think. Four and a half, yeah. Maybe it was six or seven years ago, something like that. But in, anyway, so um, yeah, if you're familiar with any of the old Deltas, I don't know anything more about like which pen models might come back or exactly when, but it's probably something like as we get into 2022, we'll start to see some of this. Um, but this is public information now. They just announced it. I don't know how long it's been in the works, but I imagine quite a while. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool to see. Uh, he's going to be using some of uh, some of the original machinery that made the Delta pens, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps even some original materials. We don't know yet, but um, it's not just the name; it's it's the facilities as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, pretty cool, very exciting, and I know it's a big deal for Nino as well. Um, so mm -hmm. that's uh, pretty rad. So yeah, that's kind of pretty notable. Not every day that that happens in the pen world. Certainly not. Um, and then just like a brief recap, just timing of the year, you know, there's, I guess, some notability around the timeline with Black Friday, Cyber Monday, all that kind of stuff. I don't know what that means this year over previous years because it's like such a spread out and bizarro holiday season for all retail in general because of shipping delays and log jams at the shipping ports and all these types of things. Um, but basically we decided not to do a big heavy sales on Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend. Um, and uh, we didn't, and we did some like little things here and there, but we just kind of have been telling you all for a while, like, hey, go ahead and get your orders in early, spread it out. We're gonna see shipping delays. We are seeing shipping delays. Um, and uh, you know, it's mostly working out okay though. So like our team has gotten caught up from the weekend. It's usually, Usually it takes us like all week this week to get caught up from this kind of like four day weekend thing. It doesn't help that we have the Thanksgiving holiday in there. So we're taking time off for our families. Also people are shopping a lot. Um, so usually it takes us a little while to get caught up, but our team has really crushed it and we're, we're pretty much on top of things. But um, you know, definitely still go ahead and order anything that you're trying to order, not just from us, but anywhere, anything you want for the holidays, get it in as soon as you can because um, yeah, shipping is going to be uh, pretty ridiculous this year. Um, so yeah, that's my that's my thing. So we're we're holding steady, not not lighting the world on fire this year, but the team is doing well, we're holding strong, and keeping our sanity, which is exactly the goal. All right, what is on your desk, Drew? Before we wrap up, 
I see you have uh, my my, my stuff. Pens. Well, I've got th <laughs> I've got three pens inked up, Brian. Surprise, surprise. Hey, shocker. Um, so do I. Still use still using the E ninety five S. You have three I've, and four I've and five three, and yeah. six. I've, yeah, well, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, so using my E95S with Noodler's um, uh, Nightshade. Nice. And then I still am not able to unink my Prussian Blue mm. 580 mm -hmm. with Noodler's Navy. The the look of this Noodler's Navy in the 1.1 nib is stunning. And then, of course, my Miami Knights Edison mm. with Sailor Ink Studio 224. This is the first time in a while, Brian, I have had two stub nibs inked up. Because Ooh. usually my preferred loadout is a very, very fine nib, which is this. Okay a kind of middle of the road nib, like a finer medium, and then a fun nib, which is like a stub or a flex. Mm. Now I've got two fun nibs, so I'm kind of messing with my system a little bit. Uh, but it's fine, it's fine. It's okay, I can deal with it. It's, mm. not, it's, not, it's not insurmountable. I mean, and also on my desk, Brian, so I was drinking my coffee out of this today, right? Okay. And I was waiting for you to get ready, and I'm like, oh my gosh, my coffee is getting cold. What should I do? I need to cover it up with something. Oh, look at this Namiki bottle. Oh, <laughs> look at that! Look at this nice little. Wow, that's, that's, that's just delightful. It totally didn't work, and I probably heated up my ink more than I should. Yeah, um, you probably, it's probably gonna. You probably took four or five <laughs> days off the life stupid. of your ink. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I did that. So, as far as my desk activity, there you go. There you go. So, if you need a a coffee cooler, um... <laughs> it, no, it, an ineffective coffee cooler that <laughs> is putting your ink through stress, then yeah, nice. you betcha. There you go. Don't 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 do that. What's on your desk, Brian? I thought you said you kind of cleaned up a lot, didn't you? Oh well, yeah, sort of. Or you moved stuff. Well, okay, so now I mean, sort of. Well, all right. So here's what happened. So um, <laughs> my my niece and nephew are four and six, and uh, ah. so basically, like the two days or day before they came, I looked around the house and I was like, wait a minute four and six year olds yep. they get into everything oh crap okay because it's kind of been a little while since i've had a four and six year old so i'm like oh my gosh okay every nice pen that i have needs to go away in a pen case and be put like upstairs in the back of my closet behind clothes and it was like i was like i gotta put all this like i have a video gear and like lenses and stuff sitting out it's like oh, i gotta put all this away so Yes, everything did get nice and clean, but now it is not organized in any way because I'm like, uh, I have just bins of stuff that I was like, I got to, oh shoot, I got to put this away. I got to put that away. I, you know, so it was like, cool, cool. So, you know, yeah, I have nice work surfaces, but now it's like, if I need one thing, I have to like unload an entire bin and it immediately covers the work surface. And I'm like, sweet, just undid like all that. Yeah. So it'll, it'll be a process for me, but you know, that's how it goes. So, um, but really the thing that I was uh, kind of doing, um, so I wrote some like thank you, you know, cards because we, you know, we don't go crazy for the holidays, but we'll send like thank you gifts to our suppliers and like, you know, key people that we, we work with a lot. Um, so I, you know, I work, um, you know, on just writing handwritten thank you cards that we include with some of the gifts that we send. Um, and so I, uh, you know, they weren't like super special, you know, fountain pen friendly cards they're just like basically good enough cards which is fine um but uh you know i just uh picked a, a, a really fine nib i used that uh tachi miyabi winter breath with the extra fine sailor nib on there uh which you know did a really great job even on you know maybe questionable quality paper that like card stock that you know isn't necessarily designed for fountain pens um so like the smoothness of the writing experience was not like my preference um, but it was acceptable and uh, it, it, it laid down a good line on the cards and definitely looked like a fountain pen, you know, writing and stuff like that. So it was a good end result. You know, the feel of it was like, okay, yeah, I'm kind of like done with this <laughs> writing on cardstock with an extra fine nib uh, situation, yeah. but it was, it was minimally acceptable. So uh, yeah, it worked out pretty well. And I think, uh, what ink did I use on there? I'm pretty sure I used, oh my gosh, I don't remember, but it was blue. I already forgot what ink I put in that pen. It's whatever I put it, whatever I said that I put in the podcast. It was the same, it was the same ink, which I've already forgotten what it is. Was it blue water ice? Mm, maybe. I can't remember. <laughs> I'll have to go back and look at a past episode. It's whatever I had in it when I inked it up. I can't, I, it might've been that, but I honestly don't remember. I have way too many blue inks and I don't uh, write it down when I ink it up. So that's, uh, that's how we're going to end it here, Drew. So we're <laughs> going to wrap up for this episode. 
Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching. Um, please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Leave us some comments. Give us some questions. Um, yeah, be sure to check out gouletpens.com. We talked about a lot of different pens, ink, and paper and stuff like that. That is, the, in my opinion, the best place to find that stuff. Um, you can also subscribe to our YouTube and Instagram channels. If you want to uh, email us, if you're having to listen to the audio pencast, you can check us out at pencast at gouletpens.com. And I have a random fun fact to end about shipping for the holidays, because of course, that's what you're thinking about. Just like how you want to know how to hand cut a trail. You're like, yeah, Brian, tell me all these things that you think about that no one else cares about. So a lot of shipping happens this time of year. All told, the USPS will deliver about 15 billion, with a B, pieces of mail between Thanksgiving and New Year's Day. That includes around 800 million packages. This will peak on December 22nd when an estimated 30 million parcels will be delivered on that day alone. This is just in the US. FedEx is estimating 380 million packages delivered in the holiday season and UPS 700 million. That's a lot of packages. <coughs> this is almost Do you want to know two, a counter almost, fun fact? It's almost 2 billion packages we're talking about delivered this holiday season, which is crazy. Yeah, you have a counter. So Okay. Yeah, 15 15 <coughs> Pardon me. 15 billion you said. Yes. 15 billion. That means 3.75 Sagan units of packages will be delivered. <laughs> yes, one could say that, Drew. Sagan unit is 4 billion. Yes because Carl Sagan's uh, hobby of saying billions and billions meant that it, to the very bare minimum of billions and billions is at least two billion and at least two billion. So four, four billion, billion, one Sagan unit. I love that. So love that. Billions of packages. <laughs> it could also be one Sagan unit. I mean, it could be talking about one seven and a half billion unit and another seven and a half billion unit. So the billions and billions could be 15 billion. You have options. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know who decided that four billion was one Sagan unit, but, but that's like a, that, somebody. That's like a known thing. I'm, right? I guarantee like you, they were they were they were smarter than I was. So well, that's that's for certain. That's a low bar. Ha <laughs> ha! Ah, quiet, okay. you. That was too easy. That was too easy. All right, Drew. Thanks for hanging out with me, man. Good to see you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. You're mighty fine in that sweater. I just gotta say. Ah, thank I you, some, thank you. I somehow disrespect you a little bit more being in that sweater. <laughs> I think you look great. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful week. We'll catch you on the next one. Right on. Delightful. Billions and billions. Billions and billions. <coughs> <coughs>